okay with that. Uh, I actually like comic books and I like Star Wars. Uh, today is Star Wars Day, so may the force be with you, right? Some of you are into that, all right? Uh, and it, today it's, it's my privilege to just uh, preach and help uh, each of us to get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, I've been married for 14 years now, I think, um, as far as I know. Uh, she left the room so I can say I don't know right now. Um, this is good. And uh, to my wife, Christina, we have four children, um, three boys, Jake and Micah, Josiah, and a little girl finally came along a year ago. Her name is Noah, and uh, she's better than all of your daughters, I promise. So it's just one of those things. Uh, but four children lead to a, a very busy house with all the scrapes and bruises that you would expect, uh, with all the laughter and tears that you might expect, and also with all the dreams and nightmares. You got nightmares? I think most of us, we think back and we can remember our nightmares, the things that we kind of fear, the things that kind of stick to us that we just kind of get all anxious about. And I can remember mine. My thing, the thing that, that just struck me as a kid, one of those first moments when you think, oh no, uh, I could actually be in trouble here. And this was my moment. You got it? Let's see if it comes. It's trying. You can do your own sound effects. See it. This one right here. And then this sound has haunted me forever. And I do my best to make it look like so that they are also appropriate. Right? Right? So, the scariest villain by far growing up. And so just when this ends here in like 30 seconds, to remind us all who this guy is, I brought my Darth Vader with me today. So here you go. This guy, evil. He may stand up. I don't know. We'll see. Do you want to? Like I said, I'm used to a table. There we go. Just like the devil can't stand in the presence of God. There you go. There you go. Right. That's right. Darth Vader. And not just the voice, but it's the look. The helmet, the tall, the robotic, everything sounding scared me to death. And today we're going to talk about a guy that's a lot like Darth Vader, a guy that was extremely intimidating to the Israelites, someone who did his darndest to scare them out of their wits so that they would run away and not stand for where they were. Any ideas? Any guesses? Goliath. Goliath? Some of you read ahead. That's awesome. I was impressed. I knew it was coming right there. Yeah, David and Goliath. You've ever, you may have heard this story before, David and Goliath, and some of you may not know that that's actually a Bible story, and we're going to actually look at it in the Bible today. It's not just some uh, cool thing or fable that says, hey, we can overcome all odds. It's not about that at all. Uh, it's actually a true Bible story. It's, it's not just the underdog story. It's not something that sells uh, TV viewership for the NCAA basketball tournaments. It's not about that at all. But in 1 Samuel 17, we're going to see the original story. If you have a Bible, you should start flipping there. That's where I'm going to be. It's really long. Mike gave me like the longest chapter I've ever seen in a long time. It's been amazing. Uh, to pre I'm like, dude, are you sure? He said, yes, and you still only have 30 minutes. I said, well, <laughs> anyway, we'll see. Uh, but it's a long story, and we see the story of David and Goliath. And it's not really a story about personal achievement in the face of overwhelming odds. It's not about that. It is a story in the Bible that illustrates to us how great God actually is. It's a story that illustrates to us what it looks like, the awesome power that we can have when we live in the Spirit of God, when we build our lives in bold faith in Jesus Christ. David and Goliath is a true story. It's not a fable, and it tells us much. So let's look at this, and just like there's six Star Wars movies, I kind of divided this up into six sections so that we could all do this um, and, and kind of follow along. And if you're not a Star Wars nerd, I just apologize. I, I don't always preach Star Wars, I promise. Okay, it's just wanna, let me just say that up front. Uh, if it's not Star Wars, it's Spider-Man, and so there we go. Um, so 1 Samuel 17, uh, uh, we'll start in verse 1. 
and we get here. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belonged to Judah. So they're in Israelite territory. They're invading. They're coming after these guys, all right? And they encamp between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the uh, line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. All right, so for the purposes of today, so that you can all know, from now on, for the rest of today, you are Philistines. Ha, all right? You're the Philistines. Here's the valley. You're the Israelites, all right? You would be the army, all right? You got this? And you guys are all the people at home scared of the Philistines, and you're standing between the Philistine army and your family, all right? You got a really important job, so make sure you stay awake, all right? You got to pay attention <laughs> to what's going on here. We, we need you, all right? Here what's going on. So uh, they're, they're coming here. They, they are actually physically divided by a valley, all right? So they're kind of up on two mountainsides like this. But the main thing that separates them is that all of these guys are scared to, dead, scared to death of you. <laughs> they're just frightened out of their minds. What are we going to do? And why are they frightened? Well, here's why. Pick up verse 4. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He's a midget, right? Six yeah. cubits. Do you know what six cubits and a span is? Anybody guess? Nine feet. nine feet, right. He's nine feet, nine inches tall. Okay, the dude's huge. I think he'd bump his head on the ceiling. All right, so he comes in six cubits, and he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That is 126 pounds on his chest piece alone, all right? Not counting the big giant helmet, just the chest piece, 126 pounds of armor, all right? And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Big, big round thing, all right? This is not normal weapon. This is an intimidating weapon right here, all right? And the, his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Six, anybody do the math real quick? I'm just kidding. I'm not a math major. I had to do this look up too. The, the head, the top of this spear, 15-pound iron tip. Okay? Some of you work out with weights like that, right? I know. I don't work out at all, so I don't know exactly what that's like, but there we go. And his shield bearer went before him. So here we got this massive dude coming down the mountain, all right? He's humongous, and he looks scary. He has on, oh, he looks like Darth Vader. He has a black helmet on, you know, the big bronze helmet. He's got the big thing going on, big chest piece. Everything about him screams, I am a really bad dude. You better watch out for me. I am going to destroy you if you come anywhere close to me. Everything is designed to intimidate, all right? Now, here's the thing that you should know. All of those weapons, all of that armor to intimidate would do absolutely jack squat if you actually got in a fight. It's too heavy, even for a, a nine-foot-tall guy. He is simply coming down in all of this armor. He's not even able to carry his own shield, right? He has someone carrying his shield for him, which would have been a giant shield too, just so you know, right? And he can't really do anything. And yet, what are you guys doing in the camp? He's shaking and scared of this guy who looks really intimidated. He's intimidating. He looks big. He looks bad. He's going to get all over you. He's going to destroy you. His stature, his armor, his weaponry, everything would make him appear invincible, and yet he practically couldn't do much. He's moving around like a robot. He's C-3PO, okay? <laughs> so he comes at them in verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid, which is a really nice way of saying they were scared out of their minds, right? They're hiding. This is... He's big. Oh, look at that guy. He's too scary. Right? I, what, do we, what do we do? And Goliath is just like, what's wrong with you guys? You guys said you wanted to fight. Here we are. Let's fight. 
and I'll be the one, and only one of you has to die. If I, when I kill you, then all you guys will be my slaves, and all, the, all of you guys, any, any volunteers, right? And he's just like, no, and everybody in here? And like, not me, it's not me, I don't know. Um, I didn't hear him. What did he say? You know, all the excuses come in at that point. He's insulting the Israelites, saying, hey, I defy you. I defy you is an insult, all right? This isn't just, you're a chicken. This is saying, you're a cotton-headed ninny-muggins, all right? It's not possible. You are not, a, you are this, the absolute worst possible thing ever. Uh, anyway, that's Christmas time, never mind. The thing about Goliath, many of us, most of us, have to face our Goliath every single day. Now, most of us are not facing some freakish giant that wants to kill us, all right? And I just, hopefully, if that's you, that's weird, and you've got a better story than me. <laughs> but most of us have to face something. There's many things that get in our face, that scream the insults at us. There's circumstances, the things that become our Goliath, that become our Darth Vader, that are seemingly so powerful, we just feel helpless before them. We have to face those things. And we got to come out of them and say, hey, there they are. What are we going to do with them? So here's, the, here's what continues on. Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. Uh, David was the youngest, the three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep in, at Bethlehem. All right, so he's coming in here. David is not old enough to join the army at this point. In the last story, David was like a really little kid, okay? He's probably, I don't know, barely of age, maybe 13. Here, he's not yet 20. If you're 20 years old, you're in the army. And only three of these kids, uh, of uh, Jesse's kids, are in the army, all right? So maybe there was a limit, we don't know, but... Whatever it was, David is not old enough to be in the army. He has to be less than 20 years old at this point. So he comes in here, and uh, the responsibility for feeding the army did not come from your tax dollars at this time. Actually, your family had to provide your food. So all you guys had to work really, really hard, and your job over here is to supply the food for your, uh, your relative who is in the army and whoever the relative's commanding officer was. All right, that was kind of the pay for being a good soldier is you got rations from your own family and you got rations from all the soldiers that were under you. All right, so that's what's going on. You guys are having to work really, really hard to support these guys. That's how the army worked. That's what is going on. And you're like, man, this is David's job. He's the supply line. He has to come in and, get, and help to feed his three oldest brothers. Now, the standoff lasted for 40 days. And in Israelite culture, the culture at this time, when you had to, to grow things and had to actually uh, uh, make, uh, get, get your crops ready and, and, and harvest them and do all the hard work that wasn't harvest, uh, for harvest time uh, in the springtime, right? for all that hard work, most of the time, you guys would be doing that work for your family. You're the older ones. You're the, the, the eldest. You're the ones that are responsible in the family, and you have to do all this hard work. You can't do that at the most crucial time in the agriculture society. You're away. So all of that burden is falling onto the younger brothers and sisters, to the wives, to the, the, the weaker members of, the, of your, your families, all right? That's what's going on. You're having to face this. And you, you have to, to figure out how are you going to do this. David is, is helping here at home the sheep and, the, and the, the, um, uh, the harvest time and all that kind of stuff and supplying this and going back and forth. 40 days is a long time. It would have absolutely strained the resources of the army. It would have strained the resources of any family. This is like going without a job for six months, all right? It's the same kind of thing is going on. You're just having to live and, and, and hope that, that Starbucks will provide for you just enough, right? The lengthy standoff would have, would have been a, a hardship. Now, remember those circumstances in your life, that Goliath in your life? Oftentimes, those circumstances don't just stay where they are. If you have a problem at work, you have a problem at school, you have a problem in your marriage, whatever, inevitably, it spills over into your family. Inevitably, it affects those around you. It, we don't mean to, but inevitably, we find unhealthy ways to deal with that stress, with that pressure that's coming at us. And it may just be something like at work, I can't stand my boss kind of thing. And you get home and you take I can't stand my boss out on your wife 
by outbursts of anger on your children. How dare you? Shut up, little kid. Go to bed, you know? And we get upset about that. Or it might be that when we get home, we just completely withdraw. Some of us are outburst kind of people. Some of us are withdrawal kind of people. Some of us just say, I can't handle that here, and I don't want to have any kind of pressure at home, so I'm not going to say anything. Just withdraw, not have a relationship, and just move yourself out of situations. And some of us deal with this by going to something that's just stupid. We make dumb decisions, and we say, hey, the pressure's too great. Here's how I'm going to blow off steam, and we turn to dumb things, things that don't help us but actually entrap us and move us further away from healthy relationships, move us further away from who God is. That could be substance abuse. It could be pornography. There's all kinds of things that move us away from where we need to be, things that distract us instead of things that help us to deal with that Goliath in our life. All these efforts to alleviate pain, and ultimately they end up hurting the ones closest to us instead. And that's difficult, hard to hit. The home life gets affected by those Goliaths. So here's what goes on next. He says, now Saul, verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. The guy's just reminding us of what's going on. And David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. He's like, oh, this is fun. This is exciting. We get to go see the fire trucks. I mean, that's really kind of the idea you get here. This is, I want to know what's going on, drop my stuff as fast as I have to, and then go find my brothers, find out what's going on. Hey, bro, what's going on? This is great. Good to see you. And he talked with them. While he was talking with them, behold, Philistine of Gath, the champion, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. I defy you, you chickens, you ninny muggins. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. I mean, even our king's a chicken at this point. He's so afraid he's going to give us a daughter and all kinds of good fun stuff, all right? And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. He's like, man, I don't get, are you serious? This is all, I get all this if we just beat the guy? I don't understand. What's the deal? What, what's going on? Youthful idealism at its best, right? You know, you get little you get young kids and they're all like, oh, I don't understand. Well, just do it. I don't know. What are you two talking about? All right. Now, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, bro, what I do now? <laughs> what have I done now? Was it not but a word? Was I just asking questions? Why, why are you so upset at me? I'm just asking. You may have a little brother. Inevitably, you're right. Inevit- you're like, man, I got this. Uh, little brother's like, really? Just why are you here? Stop it. I have a little brother. I have two little brothers. One of them wanted to play basketball, and I was playing basketball and thought he was the greatest thing ever. And he worked his tail off to be better than me. And he was. Um, <laughs> so uh, he, uh, I've lost my spot. Uh, what was that my word? And verse 30, and he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. All right. So Goliath comes in and he's insulting him and saying, hey, this is not good. This is not what we're, you're, he say, we're going to defy you. We're going to make, uh, make fun of you. Your God is no good. Your God cannot do anything for you because I am super giant Darth Vader man here. All right. I'm going to destroy you here. And then David, in trying to figure out what was happening, just get the lay of the situation. I mean, he's a youthful guy just asking questions. My three-year-old asks more questions than I know what to do with. Uh, anybody here have an answer thing? That'd be awesome. Just some way, yes or no, and just uh, I can just say it over and over. Anyway, uh, he's asking all of these questions, and his brother's the one that attacks him. His big brother says, dude, shut up. What's wrong with you? You're, you're a fool. You're here just to pick a fight, and you're a jerk, and I, man... And just total big brother moment, right? You know, slug bug, right? Kind of pow, shut up, you little kid, right? And you get this, this tension going on here. Man, 
For us, the hardest battles in our life tend to be with the people that we know the best. It always seems to happen that way, right? I mean, just think about it. Who is it you've had the most conflict with? Your Goliath might surprise you. He might not be a very clear-cut enemy that's coming at you from ahead. Sometimes your Goliath might be someone sitting next to you. Did you know that everyone sitting next to you, just look at the person next to you real quick, that person has some junk that they're dealing with in their own life? Did you know that they're not perfect, that they actually have issues? It's true. We all are dealing with stuff. I think that Eliab was pretty frustrated. In the last chapter, his littlest brother got picked to be the king, and he got bypassed. Man, this isn't fair, right? Then he's sitting in the army for over a month, getting made fun of by some giant from near the ocean. Like, what the heck is this? This is... It's like, man, this is not cool. I, I'm being attacked. I'm being mocked. And then probably he was ashamed of his own lack of courage to take on the threat. I'm the big brother. I was the one that was supposed to be king when Samuel came, and here I am just a chicken like everyone else. David, shut up. I hate you. You're taking too much noise. Quit asking questions. You're a punk, right? He lashes out, probably not because of his anger at David, but because of his shame at himself and the way he has acted. His harsh response had more to do with his own issues than anything David had done. So remember this next time you deal with an angry person. Next time someone comes up to you, I used to work at Starbucks and it was ridiculous. People would come up and like, you made my drink wrong. I'm like, really, dude? This is coffee, all right? You need to chill out. <laughs> this one's free so that you will chill out, all right? We just have to deal with that. But so when someone comes at you and they're angry, most of the time those people aren't angry with you. They're angry at something in their life that's completely out of their control. And this is a moment of trying to take control of that situation. Their Goliath is beating them at that time. So how do we deal with this? Well, we have to deal with our own stuff and know that everyone else is trying to deal with their own stuff and be extra gracious, extra loving, extra kind. It became my job at Starbucks, just so you know, if there was ever an angry customer, my manager would send me in. Okay, I'll take this one. I'm like, really? Why? And it's because inevitably I could make even the meanest person at least calm down enough to leave. We had this one girl, she ordered crazy stuff all the time, and if you, said it, if, you, or, if you got her order wrong, she would just throw a hissy fit. It was ridiculous, all right? And I don't know her name, I can't remember now, but her order was absolutely, like, you guys, none of you could make up an order as crazy as this girl's, okay? And we would, she would make it up over and over and over again. And if anyone screwed up, I had to go in there and fix the problem and say, I'm sorry, I'll make your drink. I'm the only one that can figure it out, right? So, inevitably we kicked her out of the store she wasn't able to come back and and i got to be the one to tell her that she was not allowed in our store because she caused so many problems manager said hey go tell her she's in the drive-thru it's time i'm like really really it's time uh, oh okay so really nicely i'm sorry we have to, we've reported you to our corporate offices and we've decided that we can't serve you coffee anymore she's like are you serious i'm like I'm very serious. Your name, and you've complained so many times that your name is now on our books and we're not allowed to serve you. You can go to any other Starbucks you want to, but you may not come to ours. And she's like, well, will you make my friend's drink? Sure, I'll make your friend's drink, but I will not make yours. Oh, okay. Thanks for being so nice to me. I'm like, really? This is so weird. <laughs> You're banned from Starbucks. You know, we have to be kind to someone. We have to figure out ways to be nice, to be gracious, but we can't be gracious on our own. So what's the solution? Here's what Saul said. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear that took the lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. It's like, dude, I got this. 
I've, I've beat beasts before. This guy has made himself nothing more than another beast in, uh, of the field because he's defied God. He's nothing more than a lion or a bear at this point. I've killed those. I can kill this guy. He's just a beast, whatever. He's, a, he's an animal. He's not a human. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So he's like, man, I got this. I understand. I got it all under control. I can do whatever is needed. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. He's like, oh, you go to war. This is what it looks like. Put on a helmet, put on a, a vest, and wear a sword. Most Israelites, that's, at the most, that's the kind of armor they would have. This is the king's armor, too. I mean, this is a big deal. This is, some good, this is the quality stuff. David puts it on. Then David said to Saul, Oh, dude, I cannot go out with these for I have not tested them. It's too heavy. <laughs> like, I'm not used to this kind of stuff. How the heck am I supposed to fight a lion in this? All right? This is an animal. All right? We're fighting animals. We're not fighting people here. I, this isn't going to work for me. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. All right, so he comes in here. Saul reminds David, hey, dude, you're a little guy. You're, you're not the biggest guy in the, the army here. You're less than 20 years old. You can't do this. And David's like, dude, I got this. I, I do it. His faith and his courage were extraordinary, and his logic was quite simple. If God can, give, can deliver a lion to me, God can deliver this beast to me. Uh, he's, he's nothing more than that. The Lord, in last chapter, don't forget, the Lord had already clothed David with the, the symbols of kingship. He'd already been anointed. Remember, he was already anointed king at this point. And here we get this kind of irony. It's kind of ironic. I think Samuel was just trying to point this out to us. Here Saul gives him the kingly armor and says, here's how you be a king. If you're going to be the king, you're going to be the leader, you're going to do my job. I sh I'm the one that should have faced Goliath. But if you're going to do my job, at least dress like me and look like me so that you can represent me in combat. And David says, no, that's not the kind of kingship that I'm looking at here. That's not the kind of way I'm going to approach this. Instead of approaching it the way that everyone expects, the way that is, has traditionally been expected, instead... I'm going to approach it the way with the, with, with the weapons that God has given me, a staff and some rocks. I mean, think about it. How many of you make rocks at home? That's what I thought. Not many of you, right? God makes the rocks. He's like, I got a staff here. Any of you make staffs? Some of you might. That's kind of weird, but cool. Um, I don't know. So nobody volunteered on that one, so that's good. All right. But you know the wood, you don't make wood. Wood comes off a tree. God makes the tree, and he takes up the things that God has provided instead of the things that represent a kingship that has already fallen. He says, no longer are we going to trust in the old ways. We're not going to trust the things that have happened in the, in the past. Our hope is not in what we once knew. Our hope now, David's hope now, is in Jesus. Facing our Goliath is going to take something more than just good psychology and awesome platitudes that you can post on your Facebook wall, right? People do that all the time, and I'm always like, man, you people are weird. Why do you post that stuff? It's just nonsense. Psycho babble. Quit that, you know? So it's something real. It's going to take more than learning the steps to fair fighting, and it's going to take more than seven uh, ways to be a better communicator with the people around you. It's going to take more than learning how to be a healthy stress relief. It's going to take more than that. Those things are good and helpful, but that's not the answer. That's not the thing. The things that we know, the things that our society knows are not the answer for us. It's not what we're supposed to clothe ourselves with. They're good, they're helpful, but they actually sometimes might hinder us from actually facing and defeating the overwhelming intimidation that we experience from our Goliaths. We need to take the weapons that God has provided. What are those? The Bible, prayer, community, right? We get, we get each other. This is so awesome. We, we get a group. I'm still excluding the Philistines for now, just so you know. We get a group, right? We're together. And all of those things, Bible, prayer, community, all of those things are pointing to what? A champion. Who's the champion? Jesus. And so David is kind of pointing us here to Jesus. He's saying, hey, I'm the champion. I will take up the cause. I will take up the weapons that God has given me, a, a staff and a, and a sling and some stones, and I could do this by the power of God. 
do this. I will be the champion for our people. He realized that relying even on the best weapons of warfare would not help him in this fight. It's going to take something else. This is not a battle of whose army is greater. This is a battle of whose God is greater. And David realized that. So he comes in. Here's the exciting part. You ready? And the Philistines moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. Remember? C-3PO, all right, let's do this, you know? And he gets closer. Apparently, Goliath couldn't see very well because when David finally got close enough to him, he's like, what are you? Uh, so, uh, and Philistine looked and saw David, and he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Dude, you're just a little guy. You're going to send... Where's the battle-hardened warriors that I thought the Israelites had, right? I mean, he's like, this is crazy. I don't get this. What is this little guy? And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Remember, David has a staff in his hand and, and the sling, all right? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, shut up, <laughs> you know? You come at me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give this day, give the day, <laughs> and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Remember, David's fighting this battle on behalf of God, not on behalf of anyone else. He's saying, I'm fighting this because you have blasphemed God. You have done everything. That, you, you're defying God, and I'm here to show you that God is real, true, and, and holy, and more powerful than you are. All right? And uh, the, 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 know that there's a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Now, this is the picture. You got C-3PO attacking somebody that's, you know, in, in his, you know, just a, a, a little robe thing, and he's, got, he's running around a little kid. I mean, this is like somebody trying to corral a three-year-old at this point, all right? All right, we got this. Uh, come back here, you little one, you know. And the little one's running all around, getting in a good position, trying to find the best advantage point so that he can attack, all right. Uh, and David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, which is probably about the size of a tennis ball. We're talking big things here, all right. Baseball. This guy like baseball, right? He's an Astros fan, right? Some of you maybe, some of you, I'm sorry for you. Uh, but anyway, a stone, he struck the foot, he sling and... Um, uh, put his <laughs> out of stone, slung it, and he struck the Philistine on his forehead with a baseball-sized rock, all right? The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground, all right? So Philistine army, Israelite army, can't really see exactly what's going on. Philistines at this point are like, dude, what did, did Goliath trip? I mean, really, did not even close enough to have done anything yet. What happened? So you guys are kind of confused. Give me your confused look, huh? huh? right? Good, all right? And you guys, at the same time, are like, what, ha what just happened? You know, this is, huh, three-pointer at the buzzer? I don't, what? Huh? I don't get this. You know, you get this uh, puzzled look. All right. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a the stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Remember that? He didn't have a sword. So uh, then David ran and stood over the Philistine and he took his sword, the Philistine's sword, and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. I'm not sure which part he killed him with. I'm not sure, was it, did he stab him and cut off his head or did he cut off his head and that ended up killing him? I'm not exactly sure, but it, most of us, when your head gets cut off, you're dead, um, just so you know. And then when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. How did they know he was dead? He picked up the head. <laughs> hey, look what I got, you know? And now you guys are like, gross, yuck. I'm out of here, right? And if you want to leave now, no, I'm just kidding. Don't leave yet, all right? And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron to the wounded Philistines, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shearim as far as Gath and Ekron. It's like 10 miles. They chased him for 10 miles. All right? They should have just said 10 miles. That'd be easier, Samuel. Uh, and the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. 
And David took the head of the Philistines and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in the tent. So David get the spoils of war. That's just the way things were at the time. Whoever you killed, you got to keep their armor. Anybody read uh, the Iliad ever? Some of you are smart, right? You know, they, they kill somebody, they get to keep the armor, run back to their camp, and then they go back and join the battle. It's kind of weird. I, I never understood how that actually would work in actual practicality, but that's what's going on. Uh, he comes in here, and David, he comes in, and he, he uses the sling, and he has this advantage over everybody that's going on there. He said, I got this. It's going to happen. Uh, all of uh, Goliath's weapons, remember, were only valuable in close combat. Only if he got close enough to David to club him with a 15-pound club, would he actually have an advantage? And even then, David doesn't have the armor. He's able to move. So this battle, from the beginning, it's like Goliath made a, a poor choice. Any, anybody quick enough could have actually defeated Goliath. Anybody could have done it. Any of you could have stood up and said, hey, I got this. What made the difference? David's faith. Because he recognized the battle wasn't against a giant the battle was to prove that God was great and that God was worth serving and that God was the only thing that any of them needed so that the people could be free, so the people could do exactly what they needed to do. In their shock and confusion, the Philistines turned and they ran away because their, their hero was dead. God won the battle. God won that battle. And God wins our battle. Always. He has defeated death. He is the one that has permanently overcome sin and death and all of those intimidating circumstances that you keep thinking of. Our battle with Goliath, when we are a Christ follower, is already won because he fights on our behalf. Jesus, God sent another young hero, someone like David. He sent Jesus who came and he fought the battle for us, who was our champion, who came and fought sin, fought death, defeated both on the cross and now fights on our behalf so that we can experience the victory. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus is the one that defeated death for us. And so now that is our solution to our Darth Vaders, to those intimidating circumstances, the suffering, the circumstances, all of that stuff that seems so overwhelming. Jesus is there for us. Jesus is the one that can provide a way for us through that because he is our champion. If we expect to live a life of courage, a life of victory, to have the heart of a lion like David did, we must choose Jesus. Jesus has made a way for us to experience victory over any Goliath or over any Darth Vader that might come our way. When we trust Jesus as our boss, as our Lord, as the one in charge of our life, we can face the most intimidating giants out there knowing that Jesus has already faced all of that for us, that he has already been there, and we can trust him to provide all we need in those situations. Jesus is the answer for that issue in your life. The one thing that just seems to keep coming up, that just seems so intimidating, so overwhelming, Jesus is the one that can fix that. He's the one that can help you to face that. Jesus is our only hope in life and in death. Because we are not our own, but we belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to God. And we trust Jesus as our Savior. Let me pray for us. God, thanks so much that you have done so much, that you have been our champion, that you've defeated sin, that you've defeated death, that we can trust you to stand with us and for us no matter what our circumstances in life might be because things get tough. 
sometimes things are overwhelming. God, remind us. Help us to remember that you are in control of all things, that you are sovereign, and that through you, we can have hope in Jesus Christ.